Hello and welcome to lecture 4 of the work unit in Phys 1104. We spent the last lecture looking at work done by constant forces, now we need to look at variable forces. Let's think about two objects, an agent and a target, and there's some interaction between them, and it doesn't matter what kind of interaction this is. Perhaps these are two carts, and this is a magnetic interaction between them, or maybe they're two objects connected by a spring, but there's some interaction which results in the agent exerting a force on the target. And the important thing for our purposes is that that force has to be a function of the position of the target. Now remember that for a one-dimensional case, the work by a constant force is just the x component of the force times the x component of the force displacement vector. And if it's a constant force, then if we graph the force versus the position of the object, it's going to be a horizontal line. And now we can interpret this expression for the work as, a, as an area of a rectangle, because this height is just the force, and this width is just the force displacement, and so this expression is talking about the area of this rectangle underneath the function. Well, hopefully you know what's coming, because I've made this same argument several times in this course. Let's now think of a variable force that depends on the position in some way, and it's no longer a horizontal line on the graph. Well, I can draw rectangles under it to get an approximation of the area under it. And so, for example, I could choose a rectangle which is centered at a position that I'll call xn. And so the height of that rectangle would be what we would call f of xn. And now if each of these rectangles has a width that I'll call delta x, then I could say that the area of this rectangle that I've selected here, which I could call the nth work, is simply that force times that width. And now the total work is approximately just the sum of all of the works calculated by adding up the areas of these rectangles. Well, the final thing to do is to think of making the rectangles narrower. And as we make them narrower, we expect that they become a much better approximation to the actual work, the actual area under this graph, and so we will approach the point where it is in fact equal to the work we're looking for if we have taken the limit as the width of the rectangles goes to zero of this sum. And that is what we define as the integral from whatever x initial to x final we're talking about here. The integral of this force function with respect to x. And I still know that you do not know how to evaluate these integrals. I just want you to remember that this is more or less just a short form for the area under the graph, however you get it. And you can get it formally using calculus once you know how, but sometimes you can approximate it or even get it exactly without knowing any calculus. So we've seen that work can be calculated from an area under a force versus position graph. But when is that valid? Our starting assumption was that the force had to be position dependent only. That turns out to be valid for non-dissipative forces, and we can argue it from reversibility. If we reverse the velocities, that's just like reversing time, and by reversibility the forces shouldn't change, so the forces must not be velocity-dependent. But now let's think about something like friction. Now, it's 
A common misconception that the strength of the friction force depends on speed. In fact, it doesn't. However, think about a block sliding to the right across the floor. The friction on it is to the left. But if you reverse it so the block is going left, now the force on it due to friction is to the right. And so the direction of friction does depend on velocity. Friction, therefore, is a velocity-dependent force. It's not a function of position alone, and so we can't get it from an area under a force versus position graph. And the same goes for something like drag, which is explicitly dependent on speed. We can use our newfound ability to find work due to variable forces to find potential energy functions. And so, as an example, let's do that for spring potential energy. So we'll think about compressing a spring with a brick, a very familiar situation. The brick is going to be stationary both at the start and the end of the process, and the system is the spring alone. And so that means there's no change in the kinetic energy, and all that happens is that external work is done by the brick, and the system gains spring potential energy. And so that just says that the final spring potential energy is equal to the work done on the system, and that work done on the system is work by the brick on the spring. We want the work that the brick does on the spring as the spring is compressed, and we know the force function that describes the force exerted by the spring. That's Hooke's law. And so Newton's third law says that the force that the brick exerts on the spring is just positive k y minus y zero. Now before we go any further, it's a good idea to look at some signs of things. The way I have my axes set up, y0 is greater than y, and so y minus y0 is going to be negative, which means that f that the brick exerts on the spring, the y component, is also negative. But that's not telling us anything we didn't already know. That's just saying that this force points down. But the other thing to note is that the force displacement vector and the force doing the work point in the same direction. And so we know that the work that the brick does on the spring is going to be positive. So now we know the signs that everything should come out to. What we now can do is use our definition that we have, that our work that the brick does on the spring is going to be the integral from y0 to y of the force that the brick exerts on the spring as a function of y dy. So continuing to write out this integral and using our expression for the force, this is the integral of k y minus y zero with respect to y. And this is one of these integrals that you can evaluate without knowing any calculus. Because remember, it's just the area under a curve. And so here is the graph of that force versus y. And at y0, we know that that force is 0, and it's linear. And here's y, and the area we want is right here. And in fact, this is one of these cases where if you know calculus, you might be more confused than the people who don't know calculus, because you'll be looking at this area and saying, wait a second, it's under the axis, shouldn't it be negative? But we know this work is supposed to come out positive. Well, if you know calculus and you're confused by that, note that we're integrating from y0 to y, so we're actually integrating backwards, and that's why the sign is coming out in an unexpected way. However, if you don't know calculus, I hope you're looking at this and saying, well, it's a triangle, and I know how to get the area of a triangle. It's a half the base times the height. And so the base is right here, and it's just y0 minus y, where I've 
done it that way so it comes out positive. And the height is just here. And it is just the force evaluated at y. Well, that's k y minus y naught, except I want to make sure it comes out positive. So I'm going to say it's actually the absolute value of that, which is k y naught minus y. Well, so there we go. My area that I'm looking for is a half, the height, times the base, or in other words, a half k, y naught minus y squared. And the fact that that's all squared actually shows that it didn't matter whether I flipped these around. It was all going to come out as positive anyway. So here's our expression for spring potential energy. And note that it's a minimum at x equals x naught, or in other words, the spring potential energy is a minimum when the spring is at its relaxed length, which we already knew. Also recall that the force associated with any potential energy is always towards lower potential energy. So in this whole region, the force by the spring must be to the right, and in this whole region, the force by the spring must be to the left, but that's just telling us what we already knew, which is that the force by the spring is always back towards its relaxed length. As usual, we can get the units for power just from a defining equation, and so we have that an energy is in joules, and a time is in seconds, and so a power must be in joules per second. And we define that as watts. And one thing to be very careful about is that the symbol W for watts is of course the same as the symbol W for work. And so you need to be careful not to mix up the symbols that you're using for units with the symbols that you're using to represent quantities. Let's look at an example with power. So suppose we have an elevator, which with a few people in it is 400 kilograms, and it's being raised by a cable, which is on a motor. And we want the elevator to be able to go up 10 stories, which would be about 30 meters, in 15 seconds. What power output do we need the motor to have? So when the elevator is going up at a constant speed, its acceleration is zero, and so we know at that point that the force that the cable is exerting on it is equal in magnitude to the gravitational force, and that will be in turn the force that the motor is exerting on the cable. We can do an energy analysis if our system is the elevator and the earth, then as the elevator goes up, there's a positive change in potential energy. And that's it. It's going up at constant speed. And so um, the kinetic energy doesn't change. And so that change in potential energy has to come from work done. And the only external thing that can be doing that work is the motor. And so we see that in raising the elevator by 30 stories, we will have that the work done by the motor equals the change in the gravitational energy of the elevator, which is just going to be mg delta y. And we can get straight to what we actually want, which is the power of the motor then, if we simply say it will be the work of the motor divided by delta t. And so that's just mg delta y over delta t.